So welcome to LT in Chile, a podcast about teaching English in Chile and also around the world. In this space, I talk to teachers, teacher trainers, and experts who would like to share their experiences and expertise regarding English language teaching. Let's say not only in Chile, but also around the world. The idea is also to include experts, you know, who do research in linguistics. So in this video episode, I'll be talking to Professor Pascual Perez Paredes. So Pascual is a professor in applied linguistics and in applied linguistics and linguistics at the University of Murcia, Spain, affiliated lecturer with the University of Cambridge. He was formerly lecturer in research in second language education at the University of Cambridge. His main research interests are the use of corpus linguistics, methods in applied linguistics, corpora, digital resources in language education, learner language variation, and corpus assisted discourse analysis, which are topics that I really enjoy. Topics are super cool. Pascal was the overall coordinator of the uh, MED research method. Strands at the Faculty of Education, University of Cambridge, three years, 2016, 2019. Pascual is assistant editor of this uh, Cambridge University Press Recall Journal, which is ranked 13 in linguistics. His most recent book, which I happen to have here, <laughs> Corpus Linguistic for Education, a guide for research in the Routledge Corpus Linguistic series. So, Pascual, thank you very much for accept accepting my invitation. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Jose, for, for having me today. And congratulations on your, on your podcast. So let's say the idea is basically to talk to people, you know, and, and experts and li like 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 uh, yourself and just to explain what you do, because sometimes, you know, like the idea is to explain what some areas which tend to sound a little complicated. So the idea is to try to, you know, have this open discussion about what you do. So I have many questions for you, Pascual. For the first question I usually ask is how did you become interested and involved in teaching English and linguistics in general? What was your what, what's your story? All right, <laughs> stories. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, stories um, are so interesting. My story is, uh, well, I finished my uh, undergraduate uh, studies back in 1990, right? So I qualify as an old person already, maybe? I don't know. I kind of, maybe. Uh, so uh, back then, um, there was very few opportunities to go straight away into research, especially in the humanities and, you know, and the arts, languages, linguistics. So I started off first as a secondary school teacher. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. I will never forget my first position yeah. as a language teacher. I did have um, sort of a conversation with the students have involved teaching history mm. like you know and i love history so i really enjoy that it was it was a very special appointment to be honest <laughs> anyway then then i moved into uh one of my favorite jobs ever which was uh teaching in in uh, language uh, in this case english to um uh, adults in uh, spain we have uh, something we call um, um a school of languages for adults which are run by the state and they offer language education across different languages from English to, uh, of course, most European languages. But if you live in a big city like Madrid, you can also get some, some very uh, good training in languages such as Chinese or Japanese or, you know. So I really enjoy that very much. And, uh, you know, my students ranged from 16 years to 75. Mm -hmm. So you, you, I mean, it, it was it was extraordinary. I mean, just to have groups of maybe twenty five or thirty people that the average age was maybe fifty or fifty two years old. All of them were professionals, and they really wanted to be there because they really wanted to learn the language, and they were so you know interested in the language, and they had so much to share and to talk about. It was it was an extraordinary uh, uh, opportunity for me to not only teach, in this case, English, but uh, an opportunity to learn from uh, other people that really wanted to learn the language, right? So that was that was really extraordinary. And when I was there, I realized that these guys were, were special. I will never forget one of my students. Um, I think he was around 65 or 67 at the time. And and it was uh, uh, for him. It was so difficult to pick up pronunciation. So I, that was a very probably uh, a silly theme uh, for me to start my interest in linguistics. But you know, it made me think about you know why these people really 
find it so hard to pick up pronunciation, for example. And this is how I became more involved in learning more about applied linguistics, second language acquisition. Um, and then I joined the PhD program at the University of Murcia, and I uh, graduated. Uh, I finished my PhD in 1999. So the whole thing started as, um, you know, I wanted to know more about why it is so hard for older people to pick up languages and especially pronunciation, but also maybe speaking as well. So that was that was something that, uh, uh, as I will tell you now, I just uh, uh, dropped. But that has always been a an an interest in in terms of of you know older learners. Yeah, I mean that sounds like a, like everybody has a fascinating story, like background. You know how they become involved in not only teaching but also let's say if this curiosity to let's say try to solve like uh, some problems. So that sounds like a very interesting, interesting, interesting uh, story. And how did you move from, let's say, to from this to corpus linguistics? How how did you find that interest there? Yeah, well, when I joined, I joined the University of Murcia as a part time um, lecturer in I think nineteen ninety six, I think. But then I I moved as a full time lecturer in um, in uh, by the end of nineteen ninety nine, so early uh, two thousand. Mm -hmm. So what happened there is that uh, I had to uh, align my research interests uh, with the research interests of some other researchers in my department, which was great. And um, as most of my PhD, um, uh, what I did is I used uh, um, quantitative methods to um, look at um, uh, scales and validation of scales. So I was very familiar with multivariate statistics, uh, like factor analysis and all that. Then when I started to look at corpus linguistics, the first thing I read was uh, Doug Biber's uh, um, <laughs> a book, uh, Variation, 1988, Cambridge University Press. And all of a sudden, I read that Doug Biber was using uh, factor analysis to try to understand dimensions of use. So for me, it was like a, an eye opener, like, hey, look, I can use what I know about statistics also to look at how language works. So that motivated me greatly in terms of, of reading more about purpose linguistics, other methods, other, you know, tests. And that was for me, um, you know, it was a, a very, um, comfortable way to land into a new area uh, of analysis. But I also suppose that teaching adults for uh, yeah seven years, uh, that made me think about how to use materials that, you know, were more authentic in a way, right? So I was so much more interested in, um, like, real texts or real uses of a language. So corpora just became immediately uh, something that I I really wanted to uh, wanted to use. So I suppose that's how my interest in corpus linguistics yeah. uh, developed uh, out of my previous experience with uh, teaching uh, other le uh, language learners. Well, yeah, I know that you let's say that you do research on corpus linguistics and also data driven learning, uh, DDL. But let's say those names do not say so much. Sometimes like people find them really, you know, threatening or they can be like difficult to understand. How would you explain, let's say, these two concepts to somebody who doesn't know so much about about them? Well, that's um, mm, well, that's a very tough question, uh, I suppose. Um, um, I suppose we. Uh, we use um, we 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 look at lots of language data, and what we want to do with that amount, vast amount of language data, is to try to understand how language works in very technical terms. We could say you can use that data to try to discover lexical grammatical patterns of use. Right? Probably that means nothing to most of the people outside of linguistics or language teaching, probably. But in very simplistic terms, we're talking about how we use language to codify, to code meaning in a way. I suppose if you are totally new to corpus linguistics and you are in your early 20s, maybe you could think that corpus linguistics is some sort of a big data approach. Yeah. Right. 
Uh, probably not for me, as I, um, uh, you know, I come from a time in corpus linguistics where, you know, working with one million words was a lot of data. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we're talking here about billions really? of, of words now. So I suppose a nice way to put this to somebody who is a newcomer or somebody who, you know, it's probably younger and doesn't have to really to think about the many problems or, and obstacles that we had back in the, you know, 90s, mid 90s or late 90s to use corpora and corpus linguistics is that you can use uh, big data to sort of understand how language uh, works across different uh, contexts uh, of use. So in a way, a, we can say that a corpus is, is a group of texts that we put together, and this is important, following a particular uh, design criterion. And and I have to say here that probably this is in a way um, different from what you know data scientists probably do, as they make use of already available uh, data sets that are available through I don't know Kaggle or you know thousands of different sites where you can download uh, data sets, and probably you simply don't care so much about where the texts come from, who wrote the texts. So there is very little understanding of what these texts are used for, which in a way is not what we do when we design a, 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 a good corpus. We really take care of the design of a corpus as part of the methodology. So that's something that we put in, uh, where we put in lots of work and, and effort. So in a way, big data, yeah, okay, but it's uh, it's it's a different discipline, uh, of course. And data-driven learning, I suppose the easy way into data-driven learning is to say that is, uh, we do data-driven learning when we use corpora or learners and language teachers use corpora to teach and to, and to learn languages. So the principle pretty much is the same. We use authentic texts that can reveal some areas of language use that are interpreted as useful in terms of, of either language teachers or or language learners. Um, I like uh, Guy Aston's uh, definition of of corpus linguistics as the back door to language. If you are not a native speaker, mm -hmm. I think that's that's a you know it's a nice metaphor. Like um, you know, usually you sneak. <laughs> you know, don't want to be heard. So it's a, you know, it's it's such a nice metaphor, uh, I think. And try to understand how language works, and try to find you know to make sense of it in a way. Yeah, very good. And well, um, let's say I'm interested. In, let's say in corpus linguistics and 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 DDL, you know, and data driven learning. But sometimes I feel that uh, when I mention it uh, to other colleagues, or you know, when people ask me what the types of research I, I like to do, I mention that, and so many people do not know so much about it or that it sounds let's say complicated or threatening do you think that let's say in general teachers know a lot about it or what's your experience with it with ddl or corpus linguistics like do people know so much about it or not so much i remember in cambridge there was a a poster that i liked and and it read uh if you don't have data you only have an opinion <laughs> uh, which well, I don't totally agree with. Uh, you know, it makes uh, sense, yeah. It, it makes sense if you are teaching like uh, maybe quantitative methods, right? Yeah. Probably it's a good, it's a good uh, thing to write or to say. But um, uh, I'd like to share with you guys uh, some little research we did a few years ago, uh, both in the UK and in Spain, with around two hundred teachers, language teachers. Uh, that taught different languages, not not only English. Although in Spain most of them taught uh, English, uh, and in the UK most of them taught um, um, French, German, and Spanish. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really wanted to. I'm, I'm, we're talking here about 2017, 2018, all right? So just uh, probably five, four, five years ago. So we wanted to know. Uh, whether they were familiar with some of these resources and whether they are they they actually used these these resources. So they, in terms of corpora, both 
L1, so native language corpora and second language corpora, L2 corpora, uh, most of the answers were uh, one out of five. So very, they were rarely familiar with these resources. Of course, they very rarely use them and um, in their in their teaching. The only one resource that really uh, attracted their uh, attention was online collocation dictionaries. Mm -hmm. um, um, so on average, if I remember where well, it's uh, probably uh, it was sort of three point seven out of five um, uh, familiarity sort of index uh, for this particular resource, but. Um, Pretty much, they were they were not very familiar with these, um, you know, with these resources. And by these resources, I mean uh, mainly corpora, but also corpus software, both um, desktop and online um, software. So this is what we found out, um, 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 which I think makes sense with and ties in very well with some research that is looking at um, teachers, especially in secondary education, right? We have lots of research that is looking at language uh, trainees uh, or uh, would be teachers in, um, you know, in a, in a graduate program. Uh, but we know very little about teachers, practicing teachers, in uh, secondary schools, uh, for example, or in other settings, but mainly in secondary schools. So there is very little research uh, in in that area. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I, I think I have, uh, like you said, maybe I need some more data to see what the situation in Chile is like in terms of you know knowing or if it should be included, let's say, in the curriculum of you know ELT or maybe translation studies. But I also see, let's say, the the importance of corpus linguistics. So in your opinion, um, do you think, let's say, how does that contribute? I'm talking about corpus linguistics and DDL. Let's say to developing linguistic skills or also like students' knowledge of grammar and vocabulary. Yeah, well, probably we can talk here about, uh, I mean, we can see this question as from two different uh, perspectives. The uh, small picture here is that we know we there is plenty of research in this area. We know for sure that corpus linguistics and data driven learning works pretty well in terms of of um, of students acquiring multi word units uh, such as collocation, for example, uh, phraseology. So for that type of classroom learning which is very tightly controlled by the language teacher mm. in a university context, yeah. we know that nothing beats a corpus mm. or a corpus linguist, <laughs> if, you, if you like. But again, that's very niche. It's, it's like we are talking about a very specific uh, units of analysis or you know just language units and a very specific context, which is, you know, just a, um, university education or hi a higher education context. But I think that, um, again, uh, as I said earlier, maybe this is also uh, because there, there is not enough research in secondary education, but also I think there is not enough research in terms of language teachers agencies or agency in this, in this case to actually promote uh, innovation through the use of uh, language data and analysis of language data and uh, engagement with real language data in the classroom. Um, so that leads me to the big picture. I think that the big picture and the future for for DDL, maybe, just maybe, who knows, is that uh, data-driven learning is pretty much linked uh, to um, the, um, the use of data analysis skills and the use of a sort of a researcher mindset for language learners. Remember, Tim John said, uh, you need to become uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, to learn languages, right? Uh, or um, Silvia Bernardini's, uh, we should all become language detectives, right? In a way. So I think that there is a, a link between uh, what is known as computational thinking 
and the analysis of data in the context of language learning that is not very well explored and i think that deserves more attention and here this is a very good plug for a book i wrote a few years ago with uh, Miguel Zapata, who is an absolute uh, uh, um, fantastic author in this area. I contributed to this volume, um, El Pensamiento Computacional, uh, through an analysis of language learning and through uh, the use of, um, of cor uh, corpora in the, in the language classroom. So I think that the big picture is, I suppose, that data-driven learning can contribute to developing these skills in the language classroom. And if we move towards a, an, an education system where these skills are valued, are, are, are promoted. Maybe that maybe data driven learning can find its its own place in the in the language classroom. Um, um, right now, right now, uh, I think uh, um, you know uh, exams and curriculums, language curriculums, probably are are too demanding on language teachers for them to innovate and start using or picking up this kind of of resource or you know bringing this resource to the to the language classroom absolutely i mean yeah i actually have i've, I've read that book the computational thinking it's very good and i think it's also uh, something when we have this idea of university students like people younger they're younger than us <laughs> when we think that they have uh, they know a lot about technology yeah, probably they know about, let's say, apps, maybe social media, but when it comes to technology for language learning, it's, it's a different story, you know, or how to think in a more, let's say, like you said, uh, like the mind of a, of a researcher, you know, or like how to deal with, with, uh, with data, which is, you know, an understanding that language is this entity that's, let's say, uh, also very uh, dynamic. And students need to think in a more like, you know, a researcher and also like in a more computational, I don't know, way or, uh, so I think that's why let's the value of, of of that book, you know, how to think, yeah. and, yes. and also if 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 I may say, uh, it's uh, you know, in a way, when you come to think about language, I mean, language is, I mean, we talk about language learning or L two learning or English learning, yeah. as if uh, we could isolate the object of analysis here in a simple way, like okay, this is English, right, and and and. And this is how you learn this a second language, and I think that is too simplistic. And in a way, um, the um, um, the the complexity involved in learning a second language uh, is is probably uh, you know uh, at the same level as uh, learning. Or I mean, I'm I'm talking here about a high mastery of any second language or foreign language. So it's it's a very complex cognitive uh, effort. Um, usually, this is reduced to you know in very simplistic ways through the sort of approach that is typically followed in in some language classrooms, right? But um, probably, if 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 you are a, a professional second language learner, I'm thinking of, again the data driven um, learning research by Silvia Bernardini. She used her uh, translation uh, students, so very advanced learners of the language with a very sophisticated understanding of how language works. So probably those were, you know, these fantastic uh, learners that could exploit data-driven learning and corpora, you know, full swing uh, as they have the, the awareness and the sort of raster awareness that is needed in order to to make full use of corpora and data driven learning uh, but at the same time and this is this is the the interesting bit uh, that i want to share we know that we know that i'm thinking about the meta-analysis by alex bolton and tom cobb 2017 if i remember well so um also research with beginners using ddl was really effective in 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 some of the uh, some of the, the designs in their meta analysis, so data driven learning works very well with both beginners, uh, intermediate, and advanced learners. Probably, it does, or it 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 appeals to different areas of language acquisition, and also it. But um, yeah, I think talking about the complexity of how language works, yeah. uh, probably nothing beats 
um, you know, using different corpora and, and and looking at different corpora to to try to know more about how language works across registers and different different uses. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Before. No, no, no. Very good. I mean, it's the, the idea is for you to talk about what let's say what you do and also to show your book again. <laughs> So the book I let's say I've been reading, so it's let's say very interesting. And let yeah, let's say the the um we have this image or this idea that students know a lot about technology and also like something that you, that you mentioned is like that you can also use it with students who are let's say very good language learners, but uh, authors. And there is also an interview with Peter Crossway where, where he talks about let's say that you know that uh, it's an under under researched let's say area, especially in secondary education. He has an excellent book. Let's say when he talks about that. And um, Pascual, what are you working at the moment? Are you working on any projects, any anything specific, research projects, any books, papers? Um, well, yeah, I've been, I've been, um, I've been working on probably quite a few chapters for different um, handbooks. Uh, um, so uh, I'm still trying to finish some of those, <laughs> some of those chapters. Which which is a, a huge work, you know. It's um, usually when they contact you. I mean, can you write this? And you're super excited, and then it's really massive work in terms of trying to make difficult things easy for the reader. That's where the main complexity is. So I suppose um, they are really um, a nice opportunity for you as an author to really think about how you have seen your own research and the research uh, of other researchers in the field so that's that's a great opportunity and i feel so grateful to the to the editors that have trusted uh, me with um, with writing these uh, different chapters um right now um i'm looking at a corpus of business case studies presentations mm -hmm. Uh, produced by students uh, in an um, EMI program in Spain, so but, uh, what we call here a bilingual program, an English program, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we are triangulating data from um, from the British Academic Written English Corpus. Also, we are putting together our own corpus, and we are using these learner presentations to to try to see how disciplinary knowledge actually can be tracked down. So I'm not so much interested in, in looking at frequencies mm -hmm. in terms of the use of different, you know, just uh, lexical items or whatever. I'm trying to 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 track disciplinary uh, um, uh, learning in in these presentations and, and and how that emerges in the in the data. Now we have data from first year students. In a couple of years, we will have data from the same students collected uh, two years well into their program. So hopefully that is a nice opportunity to look at uh, development uh, as well. So that is that is really interesting. And also, um, I've just uh, started a new project, which is funded by the, uh, the European Union, where we are looking at European citizens' uh, stories where they talk about their uh, experiences working in other European Union uh, uh, countries. So pretty much uh, here we are working with people in critical discourse analysis, corpus linguistics or corpus assisted uh, critical discourse analysis. Also, we have a, a, a partner that is developing the um, a new tool to use multilingual corpora that can be checked through mobile devices or, or you know, just a tablet and all that. So that is really exciting. It is, in a way, it is a, a project that has uh, some sort of social impact, uh, I hope. Also, we are using uh, you know, good old corpus linguistics methods, but also we are trying to contribute to the debate over migration and looking at people that come from different countries and trying to learn languages and speak languages with a funny accent and and that's totally okay and so we are trying to to make a, a, a sort of very modest impact on that area uh, through the use of as i said uh, corpus linguistics and also uh, some interesting technology that hopefully we will see in a probably in a couple of years if if all goes well 
It may be a, a question that you know that has uh, you know big be, uh, begun to appear a lot, which is the influence of artificial in intelligence. You know, like people are maybe mixing you know corpus linguistics with uh, AI and do you see, let's say, a sort of, um, I don't know, influence there? Or do you see some something happening there with, you know, you mentioned big data at the beginning. You know, you also mentioned, let's say, lots of, uh, I don't know, billions of words. Do you, do you see a connection there or something like maybe an advantage that, that can be used? Yeah, well, I think that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, there is so much, I mean, there uh, in the last week or, or, or so. <laughs> I'm, I'm a massive Twitter uh, user, and <laughs> I think I've retweeted probably five or six papers discussing the impact of artificial intelligence on academic writing. Yeah. And I'm like, gosh, I mean, you know, <laughs> fantastic, you know, that that uh, we have these resources uh, um, just available a few weeks ago, and we have uh, some thinking around how to better best use these resources. Let me do something now. Um, in uh, this book, we I had the privilege and the honor to have a conversation with Tony McHenry and Michael McCarthy together with, uh, with Joel Mark and the main the main idea was to sort of think about and to talk about 25 years of data driven learning and talk as Tony McHenry organized back in 2018 i think it was about 25 years that Tony McHenry organized the i think the first or the second talk in in Lancaster so it was such a great opportunity to have both Tony McHenry and and Michael McCarthy and it's it's funny how I think is somewhere here they talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, we had this conversation, I think it was two years ago. Yeah. Uh, which is fascinating. Oh yeah, this is this is thing. I think it's it's Sonny McHenry. He um so uh, sometimes I think reflecting back on those areas where we haven't made an impact, where we can make an or where we can't make an impact is very useful for corpus people because then it reflects back on our practice, it isn't just that we are going to spontaneously be innovative. We know that there are important areas where we are not making an impact, and that's where we should be innovative. I quite like the idea of guided innovation mm. and a recovery of what we knew. So I agree with Mike, uh, AI, with, with Mike McCarthy, AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on, can be very, very interesting and really give us some great insights. But I always immediately reject anything which tells me something i was told when i was an undergraduate so i really find this is fascinating and i think uh, this is just uh, this is just an opinion uh, i don't have data now i'm afraid <laughs> i think there is so much hype now there is so much hype uh, over uh, the use of artificial intelligence to generate texts probably people uh, in this area in in computational linguistics and data science, probably they were so aware of these resources. What is new is right now anybody can go to OpenAI and you can throw your question and you get automatic answers to your question, something that was already there maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago. The, the systems now and the machines probably working um, on those answers are faster and free, I suppose. But so as a, Again, I think uh, the, qu the question here is, how do we make sense of these innovations in what we do, right? And um, again, I was thinking about, um, you know, back in the day, there was so much uh, coming and going uh, in terms of making sure that students wouldn't use Google Translate, yeah. like, yeah. you know. And uh, uh, now we see these, uh, in a different way. So now it's m so much more about how to make sure that if you want to use Google Translate, uh, we should make sure that we make an informed, critical use of Google Translate, that we are ready to prepare our, our text for the, the translation, making sure that the translation is, is, is uh, accurate. How do you know that? Also, you need to make aware, make students aware of the shortcomings and, 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 and the problems available and so on and so forth. 
So in a way, it's not so much about the technology or you know or how machines actually can can make your life uh, easy, but I suppose it's so much more about how to become more critical, both language teachers but also language learners in terms of making the most of these innovations in terms of how you um, um, make use of these, uh, for example, in this case, uh, artificial uh, intelligence. At the end of the day, uh, you can get a text in a language that you've never learned. And to be honest, you will never know whether that text is good quality or that text really conveys the real meaning that you want to share with other people. So is that an advantage or a disadvantage so i think we really need more conversations about critical uses of of technology in education and probably yeah now there is so much hype uh, around these around these uh, areas but yeah they will they will shape the uh, education in the in the future as the calculator uh, uh, you know changed how we do mathematics uh, well, we've been doing mathematics for 50 years now. I, I suppose nobody really thinks about doing mathematics with a Without calculator. In 20, it doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 And also, but like you said, something like the first idea is to reject technology and say, like, this is going to ruin, this is going to make some, uh, you know, jobs disappear and things like that. But also, I, I also I've, I've already seen like universities banning, you know, uh, open AI or, or chat GPT because it's, it's going to, but there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, the idea is how to, let's say, to look for ways to how to maybe integrate this into our, let's say, into our classroom, because this is students are going to use it, no doubt. Exactly. And also, you know, just um, where do these, I mean, you can, you can ask, uh, What's what's the name? Chat GPT is, yeah. is that? Yes. The, and so you can ask Chat GPT. Yeah. Usually you ask questions, and um, I think you know the answers. So we tend to ask the, the questions that we feel we can evaluate, and yeah. there is some sort of, uh, you know, that's that's really interesting, and I'm sure that uh, everyone has experienced these mixed feelings, like, oh yeah, this is actually a very good answer, but at the same time, you feel yeah but at the same time it is not sophisticated or at the same time this is an oversimplification or you know but also what about questions what about if you ask questions for which you don't have the answers yeah i mean are you really want to rely on a black box to give you the answers that you don't know about yeah you know that 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 is the end <laughs> that is the <laughs> end of knowledge if we understand knowledge uh, today, right? It's, you know, so I think, of course, we are, everybody is fascinated by these tools and the impact that they will have. And of course, uh, it makes no sense to 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 ban, you know, their use or, or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, I think we really need to put the right questions in terms of really trying to understand whether it is actually a good idea to, um, you know, to make use of these, you know, in a way, black boxes to solve uh, uh, problems. I think we are giving too much uh, uh, power no. to some companies and to some people uh, out there. Uh, and I think that, that that could be potentially dangerous, right? right? So I think we are, you know, we are people that love technology. So we are very very likely to become fascinated by the new technology and i think we understand the 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 big amount of progress and innovation that that is in there but you know what about for example in our case language learners is this is this going to be you know uh, something that will really benefit their language learning as we know it so or, yeah. yeah absolutely and let's in your experience pasquale why do you think teachers or let's say people who are involved in education seem reluctant to use software or to include technology, let's say, to teach English and also in, in the classroom in general. Why do you think it, there is this reluctancy to include some more technology or say connected to corpus linguistics? Again, I think uh, it's, we, we, we really don't, don't know very much about this question. Um, and uh, we, we don't know very much about this question, um, um, probably because we, <clears throat> 
language uh, uh, lecturers or instructors in universities have been looking at our own, um, let's say, groups of learners. So we have massive amounts of uh, information and insight from university students. But um, when we look at, for example, secondary uh, education, and I'm thinking about the uh, uh, work by um, in the in the mid two uh, thousands, uh, where we started to look at uh, pedagogy corpora and all that. So uh, back in the day, there was this effort to try to know more about language educators in secondary uh, education with very rudimentary tools mm. and resources. We did a focus group in the in the UK, uh, I think it's three years ago, uh, with a few teachers in the in the UK, and we ran this focus group where, I mean, teachers with a wide range of different uh, years of experience teaching languages, and uh, we wanted to know more about their potential uses uh, of language corpora. And uh, pretty much, um, again, uh, it was clear that most of them were fascinated by the resource. They saw huge potential in the resource, but at the same time, they they found that it was impractical to mm-hmm. use corpora as we know them in 2023 wow. uh, in the language classroom for different reasons in the UK. In particular, it's because of the type of examinations that students have to go through, both for the uh, um, uh, GS, uh, uh, DSEs, uh, DSEs, right, and the A levels. Although for A levels, uh, teachers found that there was some some leeway in terms of using Copra for doing a particular type of of research oriented uh, uh, essay that is part of the of the curriculum. Yeah, I suppose the takeaway message is that, you know, we've been we've been asking the same questions maybe for too long, mm-hmm. and the elephant in the room is that it is so difficult to integrate corpora as we know them in existing uh, curriculums. So maybe there there can be a different DDL in the future that yeah. it is less intrusive, that it is. Uh, where corpora are invisible in in terms of you know neither language teachers nor language learners have to learn how to use or query a corpus or to learn about what um, mi uh, collocation index is or whatever so maybe there is a better way in which we can make use of the resources that we have but uh, in a way, we make the effort to translate these resources to a more pedagogic kind of um, um, oriented um, uh, practice where these resources are better uh, integrated into everyday um, classroom teaching. And I think the pedagogy corpora are a very good uh, starting point there. But I also believe that pedagogy corpora uh, need to be uh, adapted to uh, to the curricular uh, needs and uh, of the of the language learner. So if the language learner is at the center of the language learning experience, I think that it will be so much more you know uh, kind of easier to 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 make use of these resources in in different ways. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean that's uh, something that that uh, let's say occurs a lot because you not only you have to show that this is something that's going to help you not only you know take some time for you to to know how to use it you know because it it takes time to you know to develop you have also mentioned professor alex bolton i've been sending him a few emails so i think we're going to try to get him to interview him soon so it's also going to be an interesting conversation to see what his perspective is as well uh let's say in my view i think it it depends for example at the university where i work at Universidad de santiago um because let's say my colleagues and i we are fond of corpus linguistics because it, basically it in a way it has depended on us you know but sometimes it's difficult to create you know a course but we've been pushing you know but that's why you know it's important to have people in a way that believe in that or have similar points of view otherwise yeah it's, yeah, it's not going to be possible you know to make uh, changes in terms of innovation like let's say you you were saying and um so, yeah and also let's say um here just try to let's say uh now take a lot of resources because probably there are so many resources that you can mention 
And of course, we can share them in our, let's say, in, in our website, www.eltinchile.com. So if there's anything that you would like to share, Pascal, with us, it would be great. So what advice or suggestions would you give teachers and people who would like to include activities based on corpus linguistics in their lessons? Well, um, you, you mentioned, uh, Alex, uh, we have a, uh, a chapter in, in a handbook on DVL that will appear soon, hopefully this year. And um, in that chapter, they wanted us to give tips, right? And um, I think we did a good job there trying to <laughs> sort of walk in the shoes of language teachers, like mainstream language teachers across different uh, uh, institutions. So there is lots of research out there that has been looking at uh, how language learners actually uh, query uh, corpora. I did some research in, that, in this area in, back in 2012. And they tend to query corpora as they query Google. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that, you know, from a cognitive perspective, that makes total sense, right? So it is Google that is the cue, is the cognitive cue is how you search uh for information through google this is this is what you do on an everyday basis even even if you teach students to 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 use wild cards or or complex searches or you know what i mean so i i mean i think that is really beneficial and it's been so good yeah for i think so far for university students but probably in in the near future we can use natural language uh, as our as, as our own input so we can use um our own voices to ask systems to do these queries uh, for us so that will simplify things in an enormous way but in the, in the in the meantime i think that the best two tips for language teachers number one is keep it simple yeah use one resource at a time rather than flooding students with tens and tens of resources just choose one choose the one you feel will benefit your students because you know this is part of your lesson plan or because this is plan part of of your of your curriculum or this is plan of what you want to teach and also try to learn try to learn how your students query mm. so what what is their what is their logic behind querying yeah. their resource there so try to learn from them so that you can better understand what their you know such an information search or query sort of mindset is and from there try to offer guidelines that can be useful truly useful uh, in terms of making a better use of corpus resources and i think that can be um you know, a nice way into how you actually click with your own students and try to make a more meaningful sort of an engagement and uh, interaction with with your own students. Uh, there is many more tips in the in the uh, chapter, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably we're, we're we're going to be looking forward to reading that chapter. And of course, yeah, <laughs> when it's out, you can let me know, and I can you know share it or like where people can find it. You know sure uh, can, sure. I, can, I, can I say something I mean sure. I'm, I'm reading uh, van der Biana's book this is a, a great book for language teachers yeah. this book uh, offers like lesson plans um, and so you go you can search through levels like uh, intermediate learners or advanced or beginners and you can sort of navigate I think it's around 70 uh, plus lesson plans to teach specific language points so i'm reading this at the moment it looks like a fascinating resource for like uh, language teachers out there throughout different uh, levels and uh, institutions as well i'm going to include that in, in the resources as well so that has to do with my last question uh pasquale what resources and alternatives can you suggest besides you know the book that you were showing your own book here plus corporate music for education and um, I don't know, can you suggest any other, you know, uh, resources for people who are watching and listening to this podcast? I think um, there's, um, I think we are really lucky to have now lots of resources like 
language and teaching resources, like for example, I think uh, in a previous uh, interview, I think it was with um, um, with uh, Peter Crossway, yeah. you talked about uh, uh, scale. Yeah. I think scale is very easy to use. You can use scale with different languages, of course, with English, and you know it's it's really you know something which is it it, it obviously works very well. It, it is kind of simple in terms of the interface, but it works really well. So it, it is an obvious uh, choice for, yeah. for, for language uh, teachers, but there is there's many, or, uh, uh, and, and I'll be very happy to, to share this link with you uh, later. But also, I think for the first time, and thanks to people like you, Jose, we, have, we are beginning to have a community of uh, people that we can identify as people that work in the same area <clears throat> and talk about uh, corpus linguistics or data driven learning or technology and language data. I mean, you can name it in different ways. Um, and that's something that's, that's, to me, it's kind of new and I think it's, it's really uh, interesting. So we have the Corpus Call uh, Facebook group which is a nice community of, of people on Facebook that share information mostly on, you know, talks or or resources, but also it's a nice way, you know, where you can share your own experiences or ask for uh, support or help or ideas. So that's 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 really great, I think. And also I wanted to mention here a list uh, that was curated by the Sydney Corpus Lab which is a list um, of uh, video talks on corpus linguistics, uh, including also uh, data-driven learning and, and, and related areas. So that for teachers that are really or really want to become familiar with the topic or are already familiar with the topic or want to go deeper into some of, of the areas is a fantastic resource. It is it's, It has been very well curated by the people uh, in in Sydney, um, so yeah, I think that's that's great. I also suggest uh, Twitter. I know that people like Peter Crossweight or myself, we are very active on Twitter. We share a lot of stuff on a daily basis, and it's a very nice way, easy way to reach people uh, through through Twitter. I know that Twitter is not available everywhere. I know that, but if it is available in your country. That is that is a great resource as well. So yeah, so two areas, uh, resources we have um, uh, more and more every day, but also uh, you know we have more community building uh, kind of opportunities and events, which I think it's a uh, it's it's a great thing to have to be honest. Absolutely, and there are some other uh, resources that I'll be sharing on our website. So like you said, the idea is to basically make this more available for people who are interested because sometimes you know always the distance between academia or the university and let's say other pe people who are just like teaching, you know, maybe at schools or language institutes. So the idea is to try to have this, you know, tool to collaborate a website or a place where people can see what everybody's uh, basically doing. So, um, yeah. So Pascual, thank you very much for your time. It was a great conversation. I mean, we could be talking probably for hours, but I know that you have many book chapters to, to write. So <laughs> thank you for sharing your experiences and time in this episode. So if you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at podcast at eltinchile.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And you can visit our website also that I'll be sharing, www.eltinchile.com. So I don't know, Pascual, if you have any closing remarks. No, I just want to thank you again for having me today here. And again, a huge congrats. This is such a great resource. Uh, I've been sharing this resource today Thanks. on that Facebook group. Uh, so I hope you, you, you get new people to get to, to see your, your, your shows and to hear, uh, other, other people discussing corpus or DDL and other areas in, in language teaching and language learning. So thank you so much for your, for your contribution to the, to the community as well. And thank you so much for having me.